Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bay Area Content Marketing Meetup, where we're meeting weekly on Zoom. We'll let you know when we resume in person. Maybe it'll happen uh, sometime soon, or maybe in 2023. Um, excited today to have Erica Heald. Erica is with Erica Heald Marketing, and she's going to talk about B2B case studies. Uh, Erica is going to draw on the hundreds of B2B case studies she's written over the past two decades and show you how you can optimize your case studies couple of things Erica is going to cover, why so many case studies fall flat, how to choose the right case studies to pursue, and tips for writing in your customer's voice. Erica and your two dogs, welcome today and take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you probably won't see the dogs because one of them's asleep and the other one's hiding away, but our English Bulldog has broken down the door before when he's heard me in here talking. So if that happens, don't be alarmed. It's expected. That's what Bullet does because he's a wrecking ball. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and I will share my screen because um, I do have some slides and I'll make these available to everybody after as well. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Zoom and I are not always great friends, unfortunately for me. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. All right, so we all think that case studies are a good idea, right? If you're here today, it's because clearly you think, hey, we need to have case studies because we know that people trust other people's opinions. They don't trust our marketing and salespeople's opinions. They wanna hear from real people just like them why it is that they should be, you know, even considering our products or services. So if that's our objective and that's what we know and what we believe to be true, then why is it that so many of these case studies just sound like boring brand messaging? I think it's because we're asking the wrong questions, we're asking them in the wrong order, and then we're turning the answers into a boring narrative that then we publish as a PDF that nobody is ever going to read. And these are all horrible, completely preventable mistakes that I'm going to walk you through today, how to avoid. So at the end of today's conversation, you're going to feel confident that you can identify the right questions to ask, that you're going to know how to conduct an effective interview, and that you're going to be able to write a case study that connects. And if you want to have, um, you know, if you want to drop me an email after this, I'm even happy to send you a bunch of links to case studies that I think are really great examples of engaging case studies on what could otherwise be seemed um, considered to be kind of boring topics because we always think, oh, but we do something boring. We're B2B. You know, how do we make it interesting? You really can. And the key is focusing on your customer's voice. All right. First things first. The biggest reason that I see so many case studies falling flat is because they try to make them all sound like they'll be applicable to everybody. But you know what, if you don't sell to just one person in one use case, then that means that you're creating a really plain vanilla, boring use case that no one's going to connect with. They're not gonna see themselves in that case study. Instead, I like to have kind of a consistent framework, but then I take that framework and I create different questions based upon who the person is that I'm interviewing and based upon who is going to be reading it because sometimes even if people have the same objectives, the things that matter to them are going to be slightly different depending upon what it is that they actually do for a living. So long story short, you need to make sure that the questions that you're asking both relate to the person you're interviewing's goals, challenges, and the actions that they um, were able to take because of your product or service and that it's going to present the right way to the reader or the listener or the watcher of that case study. So what I always make sure that I'm asking is who are you, what do you do? I ask how they approach their use case before partnering with your company. So getting the horrible pain points of how your terrible, no good, awful competitor made their life horrible. Um, the selection process they went through to pick you, their current use case and workflows, their purchase and implementation process, benefits they've seen, hard ROI and future use cases. So it's pretty standard, right? This is what we agree upon. These are our expectations for what you should have when you're doing a case study. Now, how you actually then approach it has to change a little bit. So although an IT decision maker, for example, and your business unit manager 
both might be challenged to improve ROI, they're going to have slightly different actions that they feel like they need to take in order to do that. On the IT side, they might think, oh, I want to reduce the need for special skills and reduce the workload of my team. Now, on the business unit decision maker, they might think, I want to reduce dependency on specialized IT skills instead by using on-demand tools and an agile workload. They're thinking about it from their perspective. They actually don't care about the IT team being you know, overworked, yet that is not on their radar. That is not their thing that they're concerned about. So what you're gonna be asking them about, if you're asking them about you know, their care and feeding of their IT uh, partner relationships, they're probably gonna not be as interested in that because that's not what they're being measured on. It's not their pain point on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you're asking your question of your IT decision maker, you would ask how did implementing our solution help you reduce your operating expense and actively manage your multi-cloud environments as an example of a real question that I had with one of my clients for their case studies. But then when we talked to folks on the business side of things, we asked, how did implementing our solution affect costs and business scalability? Were there any improvements you could share around improved governments, governance and control? Because governance was a really common pain point that we were hearing on the business unit side and that we were never hearing from the IT teams. So this is a really concrete example of how even though that framework is the same, the questions that you're actually asking each individual person is going to be really different depending upon what their role is in their organization and what their concerns are as a buyer. So I'm going to stop here just to see if folks have any questions on this before I move forward. And of course, you know, there's going to be plenty of time at the end to ask me all of the crazy questions you'd like. Which one is so stop saying, does this make sense? Yeah. How did you find those pain points initially? So a combination of, you know, just kind of aggregating um, a bunch of customer interviews and seeing like what were the recurring themes that kept coming up. Um, and that was made a little bit easier because we actually um, always do the stuff, either record the audio or record video and then get it transcribed. And once you have um, all of those, you know, um, pieces in, you know, in a written format and you put them all into a folder, it makes it really easy to just put them all into a doc and do a search and see how many times did this phrase come up? We think that this is something that everyone's saying, but how many times did it actually come up? And you can see, oh, wow, in each one of these conversations, this turn of phrase, this problem kept popping up versus sometimes you'll have the opposite effect where you can ask your sales team, hey, what is the biggest pain point you're hearing or who's the biggest competitor we have? A lot of times they will have something that they feel like they've heard more frequently, but it's that they've actually just heard it like more vehemently from certain people. And so when you dig into like call recordings, you'll see, hey, you know what? Only three people ever mentioned this, but something about that conversation made you feel like everyone's saying it. So um, that's, uh, that's how I normally get to those pain points. It's all about the transcription and not by me. So, how do you make sure that you actually are asking the right people the right questions and to Todd's point, actually getting in there and uncovering the right pain points? I always start by interviewing the sales rep and the customer success person for the customer before I even, um, even craft the questions I'm going to ask them. That allows me to uncover things that are unique to their account and or unique to the way that they do business. So I do all that stuff before I actually reach out to them. So that way I can send them a summary of that high level framework we're going to go through. Um, but I never send the exact questions. And the reason for that is I don't want somebody to practice their answers. Um, and the only thing worse than that is if you have somebody interviewing who kind of forces answers onto customers. And when we get to q and I can share more about that because it's the worst missed opportunity in the history of case studies that I've ever worked on. All right, so you're setting the stage for the interview. When you're sending out that email and you're asking for permission to um, have that conversation, you're gonna ask them, You know, make sure that you have their permission to record it. Because if you're going to have this be in the customer's voice, you've got to record that conversation and get a transcript. You will not remember that perfect turn of phrase that somebody said to you. And if you have been taking copious notes in order to capture all of that, then you're not reacting to and being active in the conversation. 
And the best customer case studies come from having a really good conversation with that customer. You want to take this opportunity to reconfirm that nothing will be published without their review and approval and let them know that they can stop and restart their answer at any time. This is especially important if you're doing videos. So that way people don't sort of feel like they flubbed something and then just stop and not wanting to move forward on the conversation. It gives them the comfort level of knowing that, you know, if they misspeak or if they share something they shouldn't, that you'll give them the opportunity to rewind. So you just set them kind of at ease. Now, here's how not to start your case study interview. And I swear I've worked with so many people and they always want to do this. They want to jump right in and say, so tell me about how you use our brand product or service. And that's horrible because you've just told somebody that you can't wait to hear all about them. And the first thing you do is you say, well, but what about me? What do you think about me? What do you like about me? So you've turned it from being a conversation with them giving you feedback and them sharing about themselves to them telling you how great you are. Um, that is like the way to make sure that you're gonna have a really boring case study is to start by asking this question. And so many people do it. And you can tell when you read a case study that started that way. So that's putting it to your brand front and center and not the client or their experience. So let's do a do-over. Let's push that reset button and start again. Start by building rapport. Put your interviewee at ease by starting off the conversation by asking all those housekeeping questions. Ask them how do they want to be um, identified in the piece? What is their title? What does that role entail at their company? How would you like us to position your role and responsibility for this case study? What does your company do in your own words? And how does your job actually impact that? What are your current company objectives? And what are the biggest challenges that your company is having? So you start by getting to know them and having that context. And this is also the stuff that makes for that really rich information that you should have at the top of your case study that helps a reader for the published version know, hey, this is actually a person in a company and a use case that's relevant to me without actually getting into the talking about your product yet. This is just about the understanding who the person is and where they're coming from perspective. And if they have an adorable furry coworker in the frame, by all means, ask about them. If you can see somebody's dog or cat, ask about them, have them, you know, pick them up and share them with you. Not only does it give you a smile break and like get all those positive endorphins flowing, you know, everyone wants to talk about their babies. This is my baby Kupo. And as you can see, he's snuggling a pillow that I got for Christmas from my secret Santa that has his head superimposed on a military dignitary and his brother Bullet's head on the other one, because I love this kind of stuff. These are my babies. Ask people about these things. Don't pretend that you don't see a, you know, a child or a pet in the background. Use that as an opportunity. Get to know people. We're real people. All right. So best case scenario, you go through those housekeeping questions. Maybe you get some new kernels, but it pretty much aligns to what you heard from sales and customer success. Fantastic. You can dive into the questions that you've prepared. However, if things seem a little bit different, that's when you need to take a pause and you're going to want to validate with them what you think you heard. And then you're going to need to kind of on the fly, go through and redo your questions. I actually recently ghost wrote a customer story for a very large um, B2B application provider where I had been given a very specific use case to interview the person around to create this piece that was going to be on this website with their byline. And I got in there and guess what? they were completely wrong. The use case I'd been given, not at all correct. So I went through, re-figured out what the use case really was, and then on the fly shared with them, hey, you know what? I'd kind of been given different direction, so we're not going to go through these questions. Instead, let's just talk about this a little bit more. And we did a very you know, specific um, interview that was completely not what I was expecting. So you've got to be prepared and ready to improvise. Now, you're going to dig into their questions. We went into these at a high framework level before, but based upon what you now know about who they are, what they're doing, and the context around their larger organization, you're probably going to have tweaked these questions a little bit, and that's good, uh, because you want to show them that you heard them and that you understand how even what you thought you were going to talk to them about, maybe it's changed a little bit. You want to tie your questions back to the pain points and challenges. 
and don't accept those wishy-washy or lukewarm answers. Like if they say, oh yeah, it's pretty great or oh, it was a pretty easy implementation. Don't accept that. That is lame and it is boring. Instead, ask them, well, you know, what was, um, excuse me, ask them what was good about it? What went really well? What was surprising? Or what normally goes wrong when you guys do these things? Or what are some of the challenges you've had in the past with different kinds of implementations? So that way you actually get something that's more meaningful than just, oh yeah, it was great. It was fine. Because nobody wants to read that. That's super boring. And if you find that somebody is giving you a lot of those kinds of mm, not very interesting answers, sometimes it's helpful to give a really good anecdote or example of yourself. So that way they feel like you're sharing with them and then they'll reciprocate by sharing with you. So if you didn't you know, build quite enough rapport asking those questions and complimenting them on their super adorable pets, then you have one more opportunity to again, show an example, you know, give them some uh, feeling for who you are and what kind of responses you're looking for from them to put them front and center in the case study that you publish. Because it's possible also that they've only been interviewed by people who really wanted them to regurgitate brand language. Um, and so they're not understanding that what you want is for them to really share their personal experience. Now I have an example that I will share with anybody who emails me. I'm happy to share with you this kind of interview um, guideline that I use with everybody. I certainly customize it, as I noted, based on personas, but this is where I always get started and it can be helpful, I find, to have a starting point. Okay, after the interview, you're gonna submit your recording for a transcript, but also look over your notes. What were the few things you did jot down? Because although you don't wanna be writing you know, lots of detailed notes, if there was some point that in that conversation was really outstanding and that you wanna make sure you emphasize, it's so helpful to have just kind of jotted that down. And so that way you know where in the transcript also to look. Because if you've spoken to somebody for half an hour, you might get back a 14 page transcript. So it's helpful when you don't have to read it all word for word. All right, so when you look at the actual transcript, you have to figure out what am I gonna do with this as an end result? Don't just assume that what you have to do is that two page PDF. If they had really amazing sound bites, that means they probably should be used for testimonials and social quotes, those kinds of really great things where you can take that pithy turn of phrase or that amazing compliment and get it in front of your ideal customers. If they had really you know, concrete ROI that they're willing to share on the record, that's when you're gonna have that sales focused case study that will actually work as a PDF or a slide. If they had a really fantastic business transformation story, that's when you say, mm, why don't we put this out there as a ghost written blog post under their byline? And then if they're somebody who's just so excited about your company and they note that they've referred so many people to you, those are the people that you say, hey, you know, how about I write this for you and you post it on LinkedIn under your byline and you link back to us. And I'll tell you for that same um, organization that I had the situation where I went in and oh my goodness, the use case was completely different. I've done all of these things for them um, with their different biggest you know, brand fan customers because different people based upon the engagement they have with the brand and how much they love the company, they'll do any and all of these things because who doesn't like to get a free blog post written for them, right? It's hard to find the time to write about things, even things you're really passionate about so if you're offering up to them, hey, we will write this for you and you can change it however you want, but we're creating free content for you. People love that. All right, and then last but not least, these are my five big tips for how you make sure that you create that piece of content that the person that you've interviewed is just super psyched to share with everyone they know and that other people will resonate with. First, you wanna have a title that puts the customer in the driver's seat. You do not wanna have it be you know, how Bob Smith at this company, you know, worked with our brand. Those are super boring titles. We see them all the time and no one cares. It's got to be about how, you know, how this one, you know, marketing manager completely, you know, cut their expenses in half for digital advertising or some other kind of really what's in it for me rich headline. Next, you want to make sure you've got enough details that set the scene for the challenge that your ideal targeted customer needs to overcome. You wanna focus on results, cut out that jargon, walk away from all of those terrible acronyms. I mean, even SME, do you know that people are not aware what an SME is? Many people are not. 
Not everybody worked at a big company that loved acronyms. I worked at Charles Schwab. We actually had an acronym manager that was called SAM. That was the Schwab acronym manager. The acronym list had an acronym for it, okay? I worked in that kind of an environment. So I understand it happens, but you know what? Your reader should not have to go onto Google to search to figure out what you were talking about in your case study. That's a terrible, terrible mean thing to do. And finally, you wanna write in the customer's voice by using their own words and quoting them throughout your customer stories. Don't make this be a piece that's summarizing and turning into boring brand speak when you have a real life human being willing to share their concerns, their challenges, all that kind of stuff with you. All right, and with that, thank you. I am ready to take questions. Thanks so much, Erica. Who's got a question? It's not a question. It's just, I want to hire you for two of my clients. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me later, Todd. Um, I will. I will. I will. <laughs> I really love doing case studies because my background is journalism. I love interviewing people and helping them tell their story. And I think the fact that that's how I approach case studies um, is really different because, and I will give the example that I alluded to earlier that I didn't want to have in the middle of the presentation because that person someday may, may see this. Um, but I did have a situation where a remote sales executive really wanted to own that customer relationship and had a Fortune 50 company willing to do a case study. That's amazing, right? You're like, what? They were willing, ready, willing, and able. He berated the woman that he interviewed because um, she was not, she was English as a second language. He berated her into saying things the way he wanted it in answer to the questions. Because in his mind, he wanted a specific case study that said these like three talking points from his perspective. And so he basically kept coaching her and re-asking her the questions until she said what he wanted her to say. And the footage I got back for that, I had sent a videographer really far away to go do this. I had spent a ton of money on that and I had to throw it in the trash. It was unusable. There was nothing usable from it. It was this horrible situation. And we couldn't go back and ask them for anything ever again because the whole experience had been awful for the woman that he had interviewed. And then I had to, you know, have a really unpleasant conversation where I said, why didn't you read the interview guide? We gave you an interview guide. All you had to do was read the questions and let the customer in her own words answer it. And his response was, well, I wanted, you know, I, I knew what I wanted her to say and she wasn't saying it. And it was just this huge disconnect. And, you know, certainly I think a lot of times we do have those kinds of disconnects in sales and marketing um, organizations, but you've got to make it clear that for anyone to give a crap about it, it's got to be coming from the customer's perspective. No one wants to hear a customer say your brand messaging. That's boring. Right. I have a question. Yeah, thanks. Well, first of all, Erica, thanks. Really awesome uh, presentation. I've been doing case studies for a long time, and this is, I even learned something from this, so that's great. Uh, okay. So my question is uh, actually a recent challenge I have. So I have three clients, uh, which I proposed anonymous case studies mm -hmm. for. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Two of the clients said yes, and when we're doing them. One said, no way, I'm not wasting my time or your time on doing anonymous because there's no value. So curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, that's such a great question because I think um, Dennis knows this. I spoke at Marketing Prof's um, B2B forum last week on anonymous case studies. And a lot of people feel like, oh, if it's anonymous, why even bother? If that logo isn't there, it's just not worth anything. And I actually think that anonymous case studies in a lot of ways are an even bigger opportunity than a branded case study. And the reason for that is when you no longer have the pressure of knowing that your legal compliance team, your CEO, that all of those people are gonna see what you say, you go from saying things like, oh yeah, you know, our productivity has increased by buying this product. That be, you know, that's what you can say with the logo on the page. Whereas, you know, I've had situations where what the person actually said was, oh my God, when we use that other crappy platform, it would take three people, two weeks at the end of the quarter, every quarter to do this. It was a nightmare. You, we love you so much. And which of those two things would you like to publish, right? 
you don't want to have that bland generic thing, but frequently that's what you get if you have to go through all of those channels of approval. So I actually think that the anonymous case studies give you the opportunity to have real data they wouldn't otherwise share and to have that real and varnished truth about what they think about you and what they think about their, um, their competition. So I definitely think that they're 100% worthwhile and they're gonna be able to be a lot more specific than some of the on the record ones. That's great. No, I love that. I love that point there. I'm going to use that as part of my ammunition. So that's great. And actually, just a slight follow up to that is uh, yeah. so one of those case studies, they cost, my client loves them so much, they want to go to their client to get their approval to go from anonymous to a branded one. Is that's that something awesome. that you would recommend? Or would you say because then then you run into the danger that you're talking about where you're, uh, they might, they might say no. You know, I say it can't hurt to ask. And worst case scenario, maybe you end up then having both. So you have the on the record version that you know they have approved. And then maybe you have that anonymous case study that you turn into, for instance, slides for sales. So that way you still do have that as a use case. You still have that other information. Um, but I think it can't hurt because at the point that your um, client was so excited about how well it turned out, it's quite possible that their client will also feel like, hey, this puts us in a really good light. And it makes us be, seem really forward thinking and, you know, like we have good business momentum. So I think it can't hurt. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mariana, we'll get to your question in one second. I just wanted to add a quick um, side note, Roy, which is um, there's all like we always think of case studies as we want future potential customers to read these to better consider. But um, another angle is that case studies tend to be keyword rich. Um, on the products and services you offer and in your industry. So an anonym, anonymous case study could just be great content for a search because you might, so that's another angle you can, you can pitch your client. It, it, if it has to stay anonymous, it could still have some value beyond the typical use of the case study. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, and a third angle would be for renewals for existing customers because they might see value in another customer's case study, anonymous or otherwise, that they don't see themselves. So yes, yeah, all, all good points. Totally All right, Mariana. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm curious about how you're utilizing video. Um, I use a lot of video and always tell my customers they need more video. So how are you leveraging video for case studies? So back in the day when people went into offices, we'd actually send um, video cr crews into offices, or I sometimes would do them on site, like at a customer event. So we'd have like a room set aside where we'd be shooting video. Um, but now literally we're just doing like a Zoom meeting like this where the person's there, we're recording it and then you know, taking snippets from it to create really casual uh, video content. Now, of course, sometimes, you know, don't, people are, are not comfortable on video. So then we don't necessarily use the video portion, uh, but then we can still use the audio because, you know, people love podcasts and a really good conversation from somebody is super helpful. Um, but I'm also seeing a lot of folks then taking, um, taking the answers from doing those kinds of case study interviews and then doing an overlay of product. Um, so I did that kind of a case study with BuzzSumo real recently where I was their guinea pig and interviewee. And then they actually went through and showed, had somebody do the screen capture to show exactly what I was talking about. So to kind of provide, it kind of turned into like a case study with an explainer video to show my process um, and I think that that's a really successful way of using um, video because people like how to's and wouldn't you rather have a how to from a customer that's coached in it, Here's something I did that really um, helped me improve my business. So when, when is the best time to ask a customer <laughs> to do a case study? Um, you know, the best time is not at the end of the quarter or the end of the year, those are bad times. Um, and it's not when you are about to get rid of their favorite piece of functionality or feature. Um, but I like to do social listening as a way to know when a good time is. So for instance, you know, BuzzSumo reached out to me after in one of our content chats, I had mentioned how I used them and it was a use case they'd never even thought of. So they were like, they were correct in assuming, hey, this is a good time to ask her to do a real case study. So when somebody has just given you a fantastic public compliment or done a referral or any of that kind of action, those are all really good times to um, reach out to them and say, hey, would you, would you like to go on the record? Or would you even like to be you know, on the record anonymously? You know, can we, will you share? 
Uh, I think it's really about just being open and transparent. And of course, if you've also just done, if you do regular surveying of your customers, you always should be asking people, can we follow up with you? And you take those people who've had interesting things to say, who've given some of that qualitative feedback, and then you reach out to them. Dennis, just do we have any? A, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Todd. Oh, just in a Twitter chat this morning, Roy gave some pretty good advice on actually putting putting something in your in your contract that you can use, you know, not not committing them to a case study, but that you can use, you know, their logo and yep. and you know the situation <gasps> in your working material. Okay, Roy has totally distracted me with an adorable <laughs> baby. Who is that, Roy? That's my editor-in-chief. His name is Jasper. Oh, Jasper is beautiful. <laughs> um, no, those are all really good points, Todd. And, you know, depending upon the um, industry, for instance, with SaaS software, we frequently would put that kind of stuff in and we would give them a discount. And yep. it was like, you know, this is the price if you have, if you agree to this. If you don't agree to this language, well, then we take away that, you know, 10% discount. Like it was never a huge discount, but it was typically like a 10% discount. And, you know, if the CFO has to approve the contract frequently, then you actually get to do that stuff because they're happy to save off of a recurring subscription, especially if you're going to have multiple seats. We have two questions in the chat. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, Brian, do you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. I, I was just wondering if there's any uh, particular considerations when you're doing the interview, when you know you're collecting a case study to use on multiple uh, different channels, say in social and uh, perhaps a book or audio book or anything like that, or if you pretty much collect it agnostic of you know whatever channel you're going to be delivering it on. Unless it's somebody I've spoken with previously, um, I usually take an agnostic approach. Now, if I've done um, a case study with them previously and I'm doing like a follow up then I might be like, all right, so we had this use, we had this case study that worked really well on this channel, but we didn't have any really good sound bites for social. So then I might change up like what I'm, what I'm asking them and how I'm asking. So that's a really good question. We'll go to one from the chat. This is from Pri or Pri. What are the key growth metrics to include in a case study? You know, it kind of depends on what your product is. So, but in general, I always try to include some productivity measures because everybody is trying to do more with less. I try to um, put in any kind of um, operational efficiencies that I know about, like any kind of like integration points that um, were being able to be made or any like anything that we've been able to do more with existing or things we've been able to replace. Um, for example, like if you've been able to replace three different pieces of software with one new piece, that's always really compelling. Um, it's usually hard to get like a, a concrete ROI um, unless you bake it into the way that you onboard your clients. So in at least two situations when I was in-house, I was able to get part of the onboarding process to do a very simple kind of assessment to see where people were currently with certain things like how long things took how much they were spending etc and then when we would do renewal we would actually then see based upon their uses of the platform how had those things changed and then we would have that kind of data um, for later but usually you know the first time again if it's a new customer it's the first time you're talking to them you're not necessarily going to have as much data um, that's concrete um, it really really depends on what you're um, what you can actually get yourself versus what you have to ask them to give you from a data perspective. So sorry, I hate those kinds of answers that are like, it depends, but it depends. Another one, this is an interesting question from Jessica. So this refers to, I think one of your closing slides, Erica, where you're talking about don't, don't accept like a lukewarm answer. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what if you know everything in an inter the interview, the interviewee is saying is generic and not helpful? yet they seem unable to switch gears. Are you frank with them and tell them that this will not result in a helpful case study? You know, what I usually do when that's kind of happening is I try to like do a break from my Q&A. So I'm like, all right, so something about this is just not working. So then I'll be like, you know, oh, you know, let's take a minute and, you know, I want to make sure that you know, the end piece is something that you're really excited about sharing with your network 
and that makes you come across as you know as an expert in your industry i'm just not sure that we're that we're you know quite there yet so why don't you talk to me a little bit about things that you're hearing you know from your peers or conversations that you've had about this and so i usually just get them talking in a way because i'm assuming that it's the, something about being interviewed is putting them off that something about feeling really on the record and having to respond to those questions is causing them to feel like they can't really express themselves and deviate whereas having a conversation feels a lot less threatening, a lot less stressful. So that's usually what I try to do is I try to do the break because if I keep asking them my questions and they keep answering them like blah, 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 you know, you're right. It's not going to get, it's not going to do anybody any good. And when you have them kind of stop and think about, do you want your name on this? Do you want to be the person that said all of this boring crap to me and have that, is that going to be something you're going to share on LinkedIn? Um, once people think about it that way, I think then it can help them reframe because guess what? We're going to share the case study on LinkedIn and we're going to tag you. Do you want to be the most boring person, the most boring marketing manager in the world talking about boring stuff and making everyone snore? You do not. <laughs> oh, another baby. Sorry. Mel, who's that? I have a black kitty too. That's Onyx, who I usually just call her kitty girl because we have an older male cat. She's newer. My uh, younger daughter got her with her Christmas money. And she's not a huge fan of being held for very long, but Aww. she came around. So thank you for sharing her. She, she's, she's warming up a little bit. She's fun. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Rich, you're next up. I, I want to rush out and get, we have both a black cat and a gray cat, but they're, 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 they're feral beasts. They're outside. Same, same. The other cats are uh, Russian blue. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you, Erica. A couple comments leading to a question. Um, mm -hmm. I think you, you really touched on some foundational kind of fundamental truths for what make content interesting and engaging. People want to read about people. Yeah. And um, I'll share later some of the, um, the kind of transcendent editorial truths I learned as a tech journalist for Ziff Davis Computer Magazines back in the 90s. I then applied as a marketer. And the challenge I had was um, in, in a product marketing role in a large enterprise software company where um, the product I was responsible for was too small to get support from the customer references group. So I had to roll my, my own. And uh, you touched on something there about, about LinkedIn. Like, would, would they wanna see this on LinkedIn with their name associated to it? Yep. Uh, my comment question is, I was always interested in what was the motivation behind the person who agreed to be interviewed by me for the case study. And mm -hmm. I, and I would try to uh, figure out, well, what, what are they doing? They're, they're using this to further their career. Yep. And, and where is the, where it's kind of the win, win, win. And, and in the storytelling, I try to learn as much as I could about them because um, from my perspective, they're the customer is the protagonist and she has a goal to achieve. It's not easily achieved. There's, there's, you know, some advancement, some setback, and ultimately a successful resolution. Um, the 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 extent to which I could I could push back on product propaganda, and 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 hollow value propositions. Oh, we need the value prop in here. No, that's we're not going to put words in the customer's uh, mouth, right? No one wants to read that, right? It becomes <laughs> formulaic and and temp and over. I mean, it's good to have a template, but but that should be scaffolding, not not stifling. So in all that comment, here's the here's the here's the question: um, In the B two B enterprise space, um, are you are you seeing a, a really great example of consistently excellent um, case studies that that uh, that that we that you could point us toward? Mm -hmm. um, I would say Salesforce. I was going to say the same. Yeah. I'm glad you said it. Yeah. Um, and disclosure, yes, they are. Um, they have been a client of mine, yeah. and um, they do a really good job because they have their, um, you know, they have various ways that they uh, reward and recognize customers who are those big brand advocates, yeah. and then they tap into them for um, case study interviews, for bylines, for social content, and for quotes that then go into everything that they do. They yeah. do a really good job of putting the customer's front and center. Yeah, I just chatted a link to it, and and um, I like that it's 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 templated in a way that it it you can deliver them at scale because there's mm -hmm. probably tens of thousands of or at least thousands of 
stories there. Um, yeah. Yet it's not so constrained that it feels cookie cutter because each and every one of the stories I'm like, wow, ah, I want to read that. So yeah. Anyway, thank you for your presentation. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I love, like I said, I love case studies. And whenever I have the opportunity to help companies figure this stuff out, it's been awesome. And, you know, I will tell you, um, one of my other big case study clients that I worked with was Slack. And I wrote dozens for them. And what was fun about that is every company used Slack for a different use case. They had something different that they were using Slack to do within their company. And frequently, you know, Slack had no idea about, you know, these things that folks were doing. And it was just always amazing to have all these completely different companies that had found that this, you know, little business application tool had been, you know, actually transformational for the way that they did business. And I love talking to those folks because I got so many great ideas every single time, every conversation. Just imagine if that sales <clears throat> VP or whatever it was that conducted that one interview or conducting interviews for Slack. We would have lost all of that. Oh, it would have been horrible. It would have been so horrible. <laughs> Very good point, Todd. Other questions? Anyone? Anyone? This has been great. Looks like a question in yeah, the chat I have, from, I have from Mariana. Um, what exactly, how would you respond if you were conducting an interview and the person actually gave you negative feedback about the product? This is, this is not something in my current role, but in a previous job, I, I had this experience. You thank them and you dig into it. You don't get defensive and you don't try to play it off. You just say, wow, I really appreciate you feeling that you could share that with me. Can we dig into a little bit? I want to hear more. And you actually just give them a safe place to vent about whatever it is. And then you say, you know, you say, thank you. And you say that you're going to share that with, you know, whoever it is that needs to hear it, be it product or leadership, et cetera. And honestly, if you're able to do that and be that empathetic ear, you can still probably salvage the case study. You can still get something out of it. But if you start to get that negative feedback and you say, well, we don't have time to get into that right now, or you start defending the company, then yeah, you've just wrecked your case study and you might as well stop recording because you're not going to get anywhere with it. Because even if you do get it finished, they're not going to approve it because you blew them off. And it's hard, but you know, as a writer in business, you have to get a thick skin. You have to have a really thick skin doing these customer interviews too, because they're going to tell you that your baby is ugly. If they agreed to the case study, they probably have a lot more good to say than they do bad to say. So it probably won't derail. I would think it normally wouldn't derail things. Right. If you, but if you, if you react poorly, then it will yeah. because they're like, yeah. oh, you don't care about me. I cared enough about you and this product to do this case study, but you don't care about this one small issue I have. Like that's not sending them the right message for, for sure. Yeah. You know, I actually build that question into my uh, case study interviews as well. And I asked in your, in your pre-interview section there yeah. with internal SMEs, I asked them, is there anything in particular you want me to ask the customer? And I try to, I try to roll that in because it's yeah. valuable feedback. So. Totally. Where do you ask that, Roy? Early on or late? Late. Yeah. Yeah. After, I, after I've gotten a pretty good feeling and all the good stuff for the study, then usually at the end, I, I bring that in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is Kupo the Frenchie. He's been snoring along, so I figured he should say hi. <laughs> is that, oh, it was the, was the other one? The snoring sound is from the other one, not from Kupo, right? No, this is from Kupo. Oh. He unfortunately, he had the oh. um, surgery for his nares, so he breathes really well now, but oh, okay. he breathes really loudly now, and he wasn't a snorer before. So as you can see, he's very happy. <laughs> And he's allowing snore, snore, snore. Very cute. All right, two questions in the chat. So Mariana is asking Erica, do you have any examples of marketing agencies that have great case studies? Um, so I need a clarifier. Do you mean for the marketing agencies that have done a good job of writing case studies about their work or that have done a good job of creating case studies for other people? No, for, for their own work. Uh, marketing agencies do a poopy job of case studies. And I think the That's reason why is, I came today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think the reason is, is that we are um, frequently afraid to ask our customers 
if we can do them. So we instead try to do a project portfolio um, and it ends up being boring and no one cares. And um, I think we all need to do a lot better in that area. Um, so if I find one, I'll let you know, but I, I will tell you, you know, I'm not good at it either because I've been really lazy about it. Um, I get really good uh, word of mouth case studies, which is how people come to me and have me do this stuff. But yeah, it's something we all need to work on. And it's just, we've got to build it into our engagements with our customers and, you know, feel, think through like, what could we give them as like a bonus in order for allowing us to share their results? We'll be like, okay, we're going to make you look good and we're going to share it. But just think about, is there some way you can sweeten the pot with them? Um, so that way they'll agree to do it. Cause we all need to do way better on that. Great question. Yeah, and Rich notes that I think that was the first time the word poopy has been spoken at our meetup. So that's. that's oh, no. <laughs> I, I haven't been to all the meetups, but if it was on your bingo card, you know, bingo. <laughs> well, you know, we'll feed all of our meetups into otter.ai and then we'll, we'll <laughs> determine if poopy has showed up before. Oh, well, goodness. I, I will chime in and say, I full disclosure, this is an agency I've worked with at several companies now and many of you are familiar with them, um, I'll chat a link. I, I, I like the case studies that Tendo Communications does. So take a look at that. Cool. All right, we have another sure. question. Oh, is your, go ahead, Skyler. Sorry, I was just, is your cat named after the Moogles from Final Fantasy? My dog is named after, or, because of the dog, yeah, Final sorry. Fantasy. Yeah, I am that person. I have a cat named Bolvar from um, World of Warcraft. Koopo is named because of the Moogle saying Koopo. Mm -hmm. um, and then Bullet is named for bourbon. And then our newest, uh, our newest pet is an exotic short hair kitty who has a little smooshy face. And his name is Baron von Smooshykins because of course that's his name. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I got so excited about the Final Fantasy reference. I forgot the species of the animal <laughs> we're holding. But, no but worries. You. Yeah, cause I just, I'd been playing um, Final Fantasy online quite a bit again. Um, when we got Koopo, so I had to call him Koopo because he's such a love. He's a friend and it means all those things. So it's a perfect name for him. Okay, another question in the chat from Jessica. What is one of the most challenging case studies you ever worked on and were you able to turn it around? Well, I'd say the most challenging one um, was when I was at Anaplan, we actually, they wanted a, a case study with HP and they actually had um, a videographer go out to HP and they had an executive do all the interviewing. So I got back like six hours of raw material <laughs> from all of these interviews. And then my task was to take all of those. And I think we interviewed five different people. So I had to take all of these interviews I did not conduct and all of that feed and put it together into a three minute video and into written case studies, all of which would have to be reviewed by legal and compliance. And so it was this huge, like gnarly project, but I had worked at Charles Schwab and everything I did there had to have legal and compliance review. And I actually took it upon myself to rewrite disclaimers because I thought they were not very friendly. So I put on my Charles Schwab hat and I went through that whole process and I actually, and you guys are going to think I'm lying, but I'm going to swear to you, I'm not. I actually got everything approved without edits and that had never happened, never ever happen. And it's because I just made sure that I made everyone look really smart, made them look really good. I didn't have any weird, you know, no weird expressions from anybody, no bad words, um, no, you know, nothing that somebody was going to get, you know, into a kerfluffle about. And they, no one could believe that it got approved. Everyone kept being like, is that, is this, you know, a joke? Are we going to have, you know, is comms going to come back? And I'm like, guys, I made them look really good, made everyone look amazing. And that's the key. So that was the toughest one because it was scary. I'm like, this is going to be the case study to like, you know, ruin my life at work. And then it wasn't, it was great. Well done. Okay. This will have to be our final question. What are some interesting ways to propose the idea of a case study? And what are some ways to sweeten the pot for you and the client? So um, I usually, I like to use the ask for one small favor at a time approach. So if somebody has, um, you know, just asking somebody that you've helped, you know, hey, would you mind giving me some feedback? I'd love any feedback you have for the team. 
So you just start with like that super casual feedback request. And then if they give you something valuable, then you go, hey, you know what? Um, I'm surveying customers. Would you mind taking two or three minutes to do this survey? And then you respond to that survey and you say, you know, I really liked this comment you left there. Would you be interested in a testimonial? So I literally just incrementally ratcheted up and you keep thanking them for investing their time in you. And you eventually get to the point where you can propose that case study. So I go, you know, slowly bit by bit. And as far as the sweetening the pot, you know, I always, if possible, um, try to work it in that there's some sort of financial incentive for them in their contract for being a quotable, referenceable client. Um, but, you know, other than that, I also do things like, all right, we're going to a conference. Well, how about we put together a speaking proposal where we're going to be co-presenters with them. And hey, if we get selected, then we're going to pay for them to fly their first class and we'll pick up their hotel bill. So we're not paying them for being, you know, a referenceable customer or for being a case study or for presenting it, but we're making it easy for them to say yes. Because, you know, a lot of people don't have budgets to go to conferences and events. And if you're saying, hey, we so value, you know, what you're doing here that if we're able to take the show on the road and share your case study, we're happy to pick up the tab. People appreciate that because then you're investing in them personally without doing anything that has to be disclosed or, you know, that they have to get permission for. So I like to try to think about what are some of those interesting things you can do. And of course, if your customers are local to where you are, you can take them out to a nice dinner and invite some of you know, their peers because who wouldn't wanna have a fancy dinner with folks in your industry that you respect. So I think there are a lot of those kinds of things that you can do as a way to say thank you or as a way to kind of even put yourself in the position to make that ask depending upon the customer relationship. Excellent, well, thank you so much, Erica and Kupo. <laughs> uh, great talk and then really excellent answers to those questions. Uh, thanks everyone for attending as well. And we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Yeah, thanks everybody for the questions. I love them. Thank you. Bye guys. Thanks. Thanks Erica. Take care. Bye.